The next item of business is the debate on motion 11289 in the name of John Finney on better buses. I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, please. And I call on John Finney to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I do mo move the motion in my name. And a, a bit of background, in 1984, the UK government published a white paper entitled Buses. Good title. Uh, that resulted in the Transport Act of 1985, which provided for deregulation of the bus industry. And these proposals were designed to remove restrictions on competition from both uh, local and long distance bus services. And I think it's important to see the background against which this came forward, because the Prime Minister of the day, Margaret Thatcher, attributed with the following quote, a man who beyond the age of 26 finds himself on a bus can't count himself, can count himself as a failure. A man who finds himself on a bus can count himself as a failure. Well, certainly the view of the Scottish Green Party, they want to have a lot more failures. We want to see a, a considerable increase in the, the number of um, passengers on buses. And, but even that legislation recognised there was a need for subsidised uh, services to continue in many of the routes and indeed they proposed a, a system of competitive tendering for these services. And it's the fact that nearly 20% of routes are subsidised. But the main objective was that this competition would deliver lower fares, new services and more passengers. So if we deal with these individually, on the question of fares, in the decade between 2005 and 2015, fares increased. Uh, by 13.5% above inflation. New services, well, as, as is widely recognised, there's been a reduction in the number of services. As regards patronage, new passengers, between uh, that same, de same decade, 2005 to 2015, the number of uh, bus uh, journeys decreased from, uh, or passengers decreased from four, um, to specs, forgive me, please, uh, 460 million to 414 million, a fall of 10%. And indeed, um, there's been a drop in uh, of uh, 409 million trips, um, and uh, as the Confederation of Passenger Transport uh, told us recently, there are 43 million trips drop in bus patronage in the five years between 11 and 16. And the decline is greater in Scotland than elsewhere in the UK. And, and that contrasts very much with the increase in passenger numbers on trains, which have increased by 16% in that period. And of course, there may be a reason for this. Citizens Advice Scotland told us in a recent report that two thirds of Scots are dissatisfied with the frequency of local bus services half of them saying that services are late. And of course, what we know is successive governments have spent millions on motorways, and the ministers, and including the present incumbent, never shy to hail the, the growth in our railways, which we, of course, welcome, and our airports and air, air passengers, um, which we don't welcome. Um, and they've neglected bus users. And there's a chance to reverse this decline, which I'm sure the Transport Minister will wish to grasp. Um, uh, the Transport Minister acknowledges in the consultation document, and I quote here, the sector faces significant challenges with the overall number of passenger journeys decreasing and service cutbacks in some places, which can leave communities without a public transport option. We, we believe the legislative framework governing bus service since requires improvement. I want to quote from a, a member's bill, which unfortunately didn't succeed in 2013, that was Ian, Ian Gray's bill on buses, when he said, and I quote here, Good public transport, and he refers to that as being effective, reliable, safe and affordable, is a hallmark of a modern, forward-looking society. It liberates people who cannot drive and provides a practical alternative for those who choose not to. So in the question of buses versus trains, the, the, the Transport Minister has acknowledged that buses are able to serve a much wider area than rail. Uh, which is more restricted by geography and, of course, the fixed infrastructure, and that bus services are flexible and can be developed, introduced quickly when de uh, demand is identified. Now, in the short time I have, I won't go into what's required to provide a, a bus service, but uh, there are issues around an operator's license, the notice given for operation, um, any variations, the role for the transport commissioner. But I think it's important to say that local authorities can only subsidise socially desirable services that are not covered by commercial services registered with the traffic commissioners. And when a local authority proposes subsidising a socially necessary service, it must hold a competitive tender exercise before establishing that. The Transport Act in 1989 um, required local authorities to incorporate the municipal bus operations at arm's length companies. It didn't specifically 
uh, require them to be privatised. And of course, as much as made as of, of a very successful model, that's Lothian buses, which I know my colleagues will speak on. That's a successful operation, a, a, a profitable operation. And it, it fairly recently there took over from um, services in East Lothian, and that, again, has been a major success. But there's been no uh, legislative action on regulation on bus services since the enactment of the, of the Transport Act. The programme for government uh, in 2016-17 said, as part of our preparation for a transport bill, we will work with stakeholders to develop legislative options for uh, improving bus services and securing nationwide multimodal smart ticketing. But sadly, the Scottish Government is failing in its targets. It's failing in congestion, it's failing in modal shift, and it's failing on air quality. And we are very keen that, um, that the national indicators form, uh, inform some of the decisions that are going to be made. Uh, because uh, the Government tells us they enable us to track progress towards the achievement of our national outcomes and ultimately the delivery of the purpose. So, um, with traffic congestion, clearly if we had better bus service, that, that would in, in improve things. I think particularly improving people's perception of their neighbourhood and in relation to the government's own information, why is the national indicator important? Our satisfaction with our neighbourhoods is an important influence in the overall quality of our lives. And when asked what would influence this indicator, the Scottish Government said satisfaction and dissatisfaction with our neighbourhoods is governed by a wide range of factors, including the local physical environment, convenience of services, such as shops and public transport. Now, what we do know is that uh, just under a third of households in Scotland do not have access to a car. And we do know that the bus industry receives nearly uh, £300 million in subsidy from local authority and the Scottish Government. But in real terms, that funding has dropped is 8% lower than it was five years ago. And as I said earlier, nearly 20% of bus journeys are subsidised, so it's entirely reasonable to have a target increasing bus usage. We already have that in relation to climate change, which includes um, both times and targets. So what, does that, what could that target look like? Well, the information is already available, Minister, as you know, with your own transport statistics um, of bus usage. Um, and by bus usage, we mean uh, journey numbers. It's certainly open to you to use another metric, but if that's more desirable, the important thing is that we, tu we turn the decline uh, that we all see and is very evident everywhere into growth. And the justification for a high-level target? Well, it's very clear, as I've said, that buses stand out as the only transport type in decline. Now, except the solution uh, that we propose will be complex with bus companies, local authorities, and the Scottish Government working together um, uh, Mr. Finney, in his last half minute. Um, sorry, yeah. Um, uh, but to make this uh, work will require clear ambition. And it's fair to say that the solution will be different in different parts of the country. All this be, can be accommodated under a high-level statutory target. It fits well with other targets. It fits well on inclusive communities, connectivity, anti-poverty, air pollution, domestic manufacturing and climate change. Ministers have already said that they want to increase bus use so let's all make that clear in a target. More importantly, Minister, let's make that happen. Thank you. I call Hamza Yousaf to speak to and move amendment number 11289.2. Uh, around six minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. I, of course, move the amendment uh, to the motion in my name. I welcome this important debate, uh, which brings a focus to, to one of the key modes uh, in our sustainable transport mix. Um, it probably doesn't get the coverage uh, as it probably should in comparison to other modes uh, of transport. We know that close to 75 to 80 percent of all public transport journeys are done uh, by bus, uh, w far outweighing uh, any other mode of uh, public transport. Um, I agree with them that we must do something, and we must do something uh, pretty urgently to tackle the decline uh, in patronage. I should say it's, it's, not, a, it's not a recent issue, uh, of course, the decline in passenger numbers. It's been on a downward trend. I was just looking at the numbers on a downward trend since the 1960s. Uh, it comes from a range of causes, some of which John Finney's already, of course, uh, touched upon. Uh, some of the factors have been identified in a recent KPMG study uh, that was commissioned by, by CPT. Uh, included a long uh, list of, of issues, but some of them, just to, to, to point out, um, of course, the long-term growth in car ownership. Uh, the, the use and behavioural changes around the internet, of course, out of town shopping. Uh, one of the other major factors, I think, which everybody recognises around the chamber has been congestion, particularly in our urban conurbations, but not just uh, to our urban conurbations, uh, but congestion, uh, of course, uh, being, being a real issue 
as, as well. I suppose my view would slightly differ to, to John Finney's is how to approach that patronage uh, challenge. And I only think there's minor uh, differences, I have to say, when I look at uh, his motion and what I know uh, uh, is important uh, to him in terms of uh, facing down this challenge. Um, I don't agree that a centralised national approach is necessarily uh, the right way, uh, nor do I think a big increase in, in public ownership is necessarily uh, the answer that I say that because I look at the, uh, I will in just one second I'll just make this point that when I look at the graph of patronage decline uh, between 1960 and 1986 uh, where we had a deregulation uh, there was 1,000 million bus passenger numbers decline in Scotland alone so it's clear that public ownership in itself is not the panacea but of course I give way to John Finney. John Finney. Um, Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the Minister taking intervention. Would the Minister acknowledge that I did say in my speech that although there would be a target, it could be applied differently in different areas? And indeed, you have a situation in the central belt where you have one successful um, bus operation in the city of Edinburgh, but the reverse in your own city. Sure. Hamza Yousaf. Uh, yes, I, I recognise the latter point that, that he makes. On the first point that he makes, I think that's where our amendment, I hope, uh, improves upon the motion because uh, it makes it more explicit, more clear. Uh, that perhaps these things said at a local level uh, is perhaps better. And his point about Lothians, uh, of course, uh, whenever I speak to, to those uh, across uh, the country, they do say, some people see attractiveness in the Lothians model, many others don't. Many others feel that uh, that, that would not be the right model uh, to go around. Um, I believe for me it's not for central government to dictate how people get around or indeed how transport authorities help them to do so, but we do want authorities to have the tools. So the upcoming transport bill is exactly uh, that way, minded to, to give local authorities the tools that they need to hopefully increase uh, patronage. Um, our proposed new partnership model is being developed to give a statutory uh, framework for transport authorities and bus operators to work uh, together on a legally backed agreement without the kind of burden, uh, cumbersome burden uh, that, that, that some of the current mechanisms uh, already have. Um, for others, of course, we're bringing forward uh, at the heart of our proposals things like local franchising, which I know a number of local authorities uh, are interested in. We've got, to, uh, uh, we've got to make sure, of course, that there are the appropriate checks and balances, but I see a lot and I hear a lot of excitement around our proposals for local franchising. I'd be keen to hear, of course, members' views uh, on that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the right for local authorities to run their own bus companies, mun municipally owned bus companies uh, as well. Uh, and we want to just remove the dubiety. There is some legal dubiety around whether or not uh, local authorities uh, have that uh, power. And, and, and Aberdeen City Council most recently uh, writing to me on this issue because there's a clear interest from them. Uh, and, and, you know, people can look at current local factors in terms of Aberdeen's bus service uh, and some of the issues they're having uh, at the moment, uh, you can see why they, they, this might be of interest uh, to them. So uh, that will be all part uh, and heart, at the heart of our proposals uh, in the transport bill, as well open data and issues around smart ticketing uh, as well. But I want to make the point that legislation itself uh, is certainly not going to be the silver bullet. Uh, we need local authorities to take up the options that are available to them just now. Um, LEZs will, will certainly be part of that, and I can, in my summing up, talk more uh, around our plans on LEZs. I, I, I hear what the Greens have said on, on, on Glasgow's proposals, that they don't go far enough, uh, and others have said that to me too, and I will say I'll be feeding that back proactively to Glasgow City Council, uh, and, and they're not at the end of that process. But there are other legislative tools that local authorities have in their hands uh, at the moment. Uh, they have uh, TROs, they, they have the ability to tackle, if I take Glasgow again, for an example, uh, on-street car parking. We know that some element of congestion is due to the level of on-street car parking uh, that currently exists in our city centres in particular. Um, so tackling that issue, uh, local authorities already have uh, the tools to absolutely do so. So we're providing uh, some element of a, of a legislative solution with the upcoming transport bill, which, uh, which again, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing members' thoughts on. And on the other hand, we have, uh, of course, uh, the tools that are already uh, in the toolbox that local authorities have uh, that I think could make a, a huge, huge difference. Just to uh, end on uh, and conclude, uh, presiding uh, officer, on the funding side, uh, we provide over a quarter of a billion pounds of support for bus services. Uh, and free bus travel for older and disabled passengers. Um, and, uh, of course, we're always working in conjunction collaboratively uh, with the bus industry uh, to see where we can uh, target that uh, and improve that uh, where we can. So I think all of us in the Chamber agree on the scale of the challenge. We might disagree about how we, uh, of course, increase patronage, have more bums on seats, frankly, uh, for our cleaner and greener buses. But we certainly all uh, want to get to the same outcome, and I'm really looking forward to hear what other members have to say on how we achieve that outcome. 
I now call Jamie Green to speak to and move amendment number 11289.3. Five minutes, please, Mr. Green. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm going to attempt to use my tablet. The last time I did this, the battery ran out halfway through the speech, so bear with me if, uh, if, uh, if I end up uh, reading from paper. Um, so uh, I'd like to start off by, first of all, thanking uh, John Finney for bringing this to the Chamber. I think it's a very good use of his party's business time. It's a very important issue, and it's one that's often under discussed in the Parliament here. Um, for that reason, we approached this uh, from an amendment point of view not and chose uh, specifically not to delete anything from his motion because I think that would only detract and dilute the message that he wants to make today. And the reason for that is that I think, equally think that it's important that the government is held to account on its uh, ambitions on this. Uh, there's been a lot of talk around uh, uh, the shift, modal shift to buses and the, the benefits of doing so and there's, there's nothing that anyone disagrees with that. But unless we ha have a little bit more detail in terms of how we measure the success of that, uh, I think it would be helpful uh, if the minister was able to address that in the transport bill. Um, now, whether or not I think it should be uh, a statutory target on the face of primary legislation, uh, or if it could be dealt with in another way, I'm very open to that. And my additional wording to uh, the original motion says that. It just says that if we can ha ha uh, produce uh, a measurable target in another way, uh, for example, in a, a transport strategy as opposed to on the face of the transport bill, I would be open to looking at that as well. But that being said, I still think it's important that the government is uh, held to account on this because it, the move to buses and public transport, as we know, is part of a much wider discussion around uh, CO2 remiss uh, emission reduction, uh, around reducing congestion on our roads and getting people out of cars onto buses and just improving connectivity and opportunity uh, for uh, towns and cities, but also for our rural economies as well, which rely so much on, on these lifeline services. Uh, yes. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. I wonder if he feels that it's entirely within government control how many people use the buses or if there are other factors as well. Jamie Green. Uh, it's not entirely within government's control, but uh, I think clearly, uh, you know, there are reasons why people may or may not use the service. Does it take them from uh, where they are to where they need to be? Can they afford it? Is it accessible? Uh, is it safe? Uh, is it reliable? Is it frequent? So there, there are a whole number of questions that I, I, I a consumer or a traveller would think about before choosing whether to take a car or a bus uh, to, to travel on. Uh, the government still has a role to play, though, uh, in, in my view. Um, so I, I think this, this leads on to quite a philosophical debate. I think there are many models that we, we, we can look at in terms of how we operate it. You know, there's everything at one end of the spectrum from uh, wholly privately owned franchises, which admittedly could be subject to more rigorous tender processes, or at the other end, an entirely uh, municipal uh, owned uh, 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 and quite heavily subsidised uh, uh, model at the other end, or perhaps somewhere in, in between a hybrid model uh, which works differently in different parts of the country as the needs of different local authority areas are, are, are met. So I'm, you know, I think there's a fundamental debate around that and what works in, in different parts of Scotland. And again, I'm very open-minded to, to that discussion. I think that this is a good discussion that we're having. I think we should have more of it. But there's also, I think, a, a debate around what we consider a lifeline service to be. And if we consider something to be a lifeline service, then on whose shoulders uh, lies responsibility for it? Uh, now, we had a, a debate in here, I think it was Ross Greer's uh, members debate, around uh, uh, the removal of routes and services, the cost of tickets, and changes to time for living. I, I, the one uh, thing that stuck, stuck in my mind on this was, I think it was Bob Doris's um, speech, basically listed the huge complexities in his part of the world around the services that were available to him. Uh, and I think we as MSPs have got a lot of representation from members, uh, from constituents right across the country when there are uh, scheduling decisions made. Now, it's entirely appropriate that, uh, that companies operate uh, to the best of their ability and can op operate services which are uh, effective, reliable and affordable. But what shouldn't happen is that these franchises so solely become cherry picking exercises where they only choose the profitable routes and then take away routes which are uh, 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 delivering to what I consider lifeline services. Now, the reason that that's important is that the government has taken strategic decisions at a central level for other mo modes of transport, in aviation and ferries. Uh, it's, it seems normal that the central government has a role to play in, in subsidising those services, but uh, perhaps uh, reading the, the, the wording of the amendment and perhaps the direction of travel in the transport bill, I hope this isn't just a transfer of responsibility solely to local authorities to, to have to deliver uh, what we consider lifeline services and what are already quite tight budgets for local authorities. Um, now, I think it's fair that if a local authority wants to operate uh, a service, it should be allowed to do so. But I also think it should do so with full knowledge 
uh, of the consequences, the costs, and indeed the liabilities of doing so. And that includes everything down to the li liabilities of the pensions of the drivers uh, through to the, uh, the continuous upgrade uh, that it will have to make to, re to reduce emissions on its fleet, etc. So, you know, I'm very open that local authorities should be able to do that. The loading model is talked about a lot. Now, what works for Edinburgh uh, may not work uh, for every other part of Scotland. So, you know, let's have this debate. Uh, let's discuss the options. Um, but I do hope the Transport Bill doesn't just pay lip service to the issue and really does address it. And that's why I think we should put more pressure on the government to deliver uh, this reduction in patronage. Thank you. And could you move your amendment, please, Mr Green? Yes, I apologies. I move the amendment my name. Thank you. I call Colin Smith to speak to and move amendment number 11289.4. Uh, five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to the Scottish Greens for bringing this important issue to the Chamber today. The, the need for real change in Scotland's buses is very clear for everyone to see. Much of our, our bus network is slowly being lost route by route, and since the current government came to power, the number of bus journeys has dropped by 17 per cent, yet bus fares have increased by a massive 47 per cent. I make no mistake about it, although there are many reasons for that decline, decisions made by this government have contributed. We have seen a reduction in the bus services operator grants of a quarter, an overall 8 per cent fall in support for buses in the past five years. We have had eye-watering cuts in council budgets, which have inevitably led to bus routes losing financial support and being axed. And there has been a failure to make the necessary structural changes, with the government opposing not one but two Labour members' proposals to re-regulate our buses. With three quarters of all public transport journeys made by bus last year, these cuts in action is removing real lifeline services from more and more of our communities. And it's those who can least afford it who are disproportionately affected, young people, older adults, the unemployed, students and others on low incomes. They are hit hardest by the massive fare hikes and the action of services often removes their only viable travel option, particularly in rural communities such as the one I represent. It is little wonder that the recent Citizen Advice Scotland report revealed that two-thirds of bus travellers are unhappy with the frequency of their service and 58 per cent describe services as poor value for money. So real change in our buses is therefore needed. The Greens mo motion today proposes a, a statutory target for bus uses and I have some sympathy for that proposal uh, and Labour will be supporting the motion today. But we have legal targets for our NHS at present and many of which are never met. Targets therefore have to be backed by actions to deliver them. So we need a bold rethink about how we manage bus services in Scotland. We need to ensure that the real alternative of radical re-regulation and municipal ownership is at the very heart of the forthcoming government transport bill. Scotland's fallen behind much of the rest of the UK when it comes to re-regulation and we have to wake up to the fact that the current unregulated market simply is not working. Re-regulation is an opportunity to start to protect those lifeline services currently being axed and to stop bus companies simply cherry-picking the most profitable routes. It provides a chance to call a halt in the race to the bottom we have seen in the way staff wages are also treated. The Fair Work principle should be included in any bus franchise agreements to ensure a minimum level of terms and conditions for staff of any bus company entering into a franchise deal, driving up, not down, workers' terms and conditions across the sector. Put simply, if a bus company wants to receive public money for delivering services, they should be paying their workers a decent wage and they should follow high standards of terms and conditions. Now, re-regulation also provides an opportunity to drive forward multi-ticketing and to end the postcode lottery that currently exists when it comes to concessionary travel, particularly for young people. If you are able to work your way through the current complex web that is concessionary bus travel in Scotland, you find that discount fares for children under 16 tend to be 50 per cent. However, despite the fact that many young people are still in some form of education beyond the age of 16 or if they are working, they are likely to be paid a low wage, the availability of discounts for young people 16 or above can be non-existent or very limited. If we are serious about reversing the decline in bus travel, we need to change the current social attitude that often exists towards bus travel, and that needs to start in potential passengers as early as possible. So we should make it a condition of any franchise deal that bus operators must provide a minimum level of concessionary bus travel for young people. And instead of trying to, to axe the bus pass for those who turn 60, the government should be exploring ways to extend free bus travel to more young people. Presiding officer, there are other rigged rules that we also need to revisit to stop our public transport being dictated at the whim of private bus companies. That includes ending the anomaly that stops local councils from setting up municipal bus companies 
and ensuring that when any changes are proposed to bus routes, they will only be allowed after proper consultation with passengers and agreement by the tra Traffic Commissioner. It is just not good enough that often the first time passengers find out that their bus route is being axed or changed is after the decision has been made when they pick up a new timetable. Presiding officer, from Unite's Hod the Bus campaign to the Cooperative Party's People's Bus campaign, there is a growing movement that wants to see our bus services change to start to put passengers and not profits first. Labour's amendment today sets out the real change we want to see and will seek to deliver when the government brings forward its transport bill later this year. I therefore move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I now call Mike Rumbles. Four minutes, please, Mr Rumbles. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I want to thank John Finney and the Green Party for raising this issue. The Liberal Democrats believe, like the Greens, that it's essential to reverse the decline in bus use across the country. We do indeed need to make bus use a practical option for more people in communities across Scotland, particularly in our rural areas, where bus transport is problematic, to say the least. However, we have a problem with the last part of the motion calling for a statutory target to achieve greater bus use. A statutory target without any penalties is just a useless piece of legislation. Just look at the statutory health targets that we have. Consistently missed, consistently missed, but of course no penalties have been attached to the government because of these failings. It's completely useless. Turning to Labour's amendment, we feel that the Scottish Government in the forthcoming Transport Bill will enable many of the freedoms that are in Labour's amendment without calling for bus re-regulation. However, we think Labour have got it right, highlighting the concern over any measures to cut back the availability of the current concessionary travel scheme. Of course, the Conservative amendment will be preempted if the Scottish Government's amendment is accepted. Although I have not been in any discussions with the Government over their amendment, we are willing to support it, because I, I, I rarely say this, it is quite a sensible amendment and chimes with what we believe ourselves. However, uh, I'm coming to that, Minister. However, there is always a however. Uh, don't get a heart attack. I want to use this debate to highlight what we believe is the very important issue of making sure that the concessionary travel scheme is not only protected, but enhanced. I'm very proud that my colleague Tavish Scott, when he was Transport Minister, introduced this successful scheme. It's successful in so many ways. It aims to get people out of their cars, not doing away with cars altogether, but it gets people out of their cars. It helps end social isolation and loneliness, and let's have joined up government here, and it's extremely good for our environment. It's effectively a win-win situation for everyone, and it's a really effective use of public money. I am concerned, however, that the Transport Minister must not hide behind increasing its use for young people, which is very welcome, by reducing the availability of the bus pass for those aged 60 and over. I would also point out, and I know the minister, I pointed this out to the Minister and Committee as well, that by limiting the money available under the scheme, the bus operators are effectively prevented from advertising the concessionary scheme, although the Minister made it clear there's no government prevention on this. They feel that they are effectively prevented from advertising it and driving up usage because the scheme is so designed that any use over and above the limit has to be paid for by the bus companies themselves. This acts as a disincentive in promoting bus travel. And I would ask the Minister to look again at that, this issue. Uh, I, I won't, I'm in my last minute. I, I would if I had more time, but unfortunately I can't. No, I'm getting a nod from the Deputy Presiding Officer. The key here must be to increase bus usage as it is such a win-win for everyone and our environment. Deputy Presiding Officer, anyone listening to my fulsome praise for the Transport Minister in committee this morning when we were tackling stage two of the Islands Bill where he refused to accept new Henry VIII powers for himself offered by Jamie Green uh, from the Conservative benches might have been surprised at my comments, not least the Minister. Um, praise where praise is due. However, I would like to heap such praise on him when he publishes his plans for the future of the concessionary bus scheme, but we shall have to wait and see. Thank you. Uh, we now, now move on to the open debate. We're very pushed for time, so very strict. Four-minute contributions, please. Mark Ruskell, followed by John Mason. Um, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Well, I think we can... Sorry, Mr. Ruskell, I misread. Five minutes for you. 
Oh, okay. Well, I'm sure I can find an extra minute. Um, <laughs> thank you, presiding officer. Um, we can all agree that bus services make a big contribution to the economic, environmental, and social sustainability of our towns, cities, and rural communities. Buses keep us moving with an efficient use of road space compared to the private motor car and the lowest carbon footprint of all transport modes except bike and foot. And if run as affordable, quality public services, buses can help young people access apprenticeships while helping their parents get to work while empowering their grandparents to be free from physical and social isolation. And when I think back to my days as a councillor, the strongest community campaigns were always to save bus routes and services and the slow erosion of council's power to subsidize and keep routes open has led to much suffering, especially in rural areas. But we can fall into the trap, though, of not questioning the environmental performance of bus services. While carbon emissions per passenger mile are low, buses make a major negative contribution to air quality through exhaust emissions of particulates and nitrous oxide. Now, the successive Euro engine standards have driven down emissions over time, but pollution levels are still above the European Union danger levels, especially on nitrous oxide in 32 areas of Scotland, from Creef to Glasgow. And this hidden killer is contributing to the deaths of 2,500 people every year in Scotland alone. Dieselization of cars has not helped, and growing congestion levels in towns means stationary private cars are now holding up polluting buses in toxic traffic queues, and the minister mentioned uh, the problems that we can have in urban areas of parking as well. So it's clear that we have to transform our bus services from being a major part of the public health pollution crisis to being a central part of its solution. Now, the government's Clean Air for Scotland strategy, or CAFS as it's known, recognised this, although action has been desperately slow, and the government still faced the threat of legal action under European air quality laws if we don't speed up. But even in this context, Scotland's first low emission zone in Glasgow has got off to such a shaky start, branded as a no ambition zone by friends of the earth and a free pass to cars by Transform Scotland. And of course, we saw NGO resignations from the Scottish Government's air quality group just last Friday. 15% of the bus fleet in Glasgow is already Euro 6 compliant, but simply nudging that up to 20% next year is glacial progress that will ensure we remain in breach of European air quality laws just as we're actually leaving the European Union with all those ministerial pledges around regulatory alignment still ringing in our ears. The major immediate problem being faced by Glasgow Council seems to be relatively easy to solve. And the Minister could really help today by giving councils and bus companies some clarity over funding. The Scottish budget, which we approved just last month, includes 10.8 million specifically for low emission zones. It is 60 million pounds worth for future transport fund, some of which is for a green bus fund. And after green suggestions in budget negotiations, there's a brand new 10 million pounds of financial transactions earmarked to support bus companies to improve emissions through retrofits. But despite the tens of millions of pounds about to be made available in just four days time in the new financial year, nobody seems to have the certainty needed to make the ambitious plans. The Glasgow Low Emission Zone is most developed, so it needs certainty over how much of that £10.8 million worth of funding will go there. Bus companies and even some officials in Transport Scotland don't seem to even know about the £10 million worth of loans that could be made available for the bus retrofits. So can the minister commit now to providing more certainty to companies and councils over the funding that will be available for them to be ambitious over air pollution. Will the Minister commit to... You're uh, in your last minute, I'm, Mr Ruskell, your choice. I'm for, for time. Oh, go on then, why not? <laughs> I'll be brief. Liam Kerr. It's just simply, I think it's an important point that he's making. It's just that uh, nowhere in the Green Party motion is anything to do with the environment reference. I just wondered why not. Mark Ruskell. Well, it, it's integral to what constitutes a quality public service, and that, that's the point that I'm trying to make in my speech. Environmental quality is hugely important to our communities, and to the travelling public as well, who have to breathe in the poor quality air. Um, I'd like to just return to the point about funding, and, a, and another question um, for the Minister in the remaining time that I have. Will he commit to specifically tasking his officials to make sure that the loan fund, which is detailed in the draft budget, is made available for those bus retrofits and to give councils the certainty of funding to help make the LEZ plans uh, ambitious. Presiding officer, it's time we made buses part of the pollution solution, not the pollution problem. 
call John Mason, followed by Peter Chapman. Strict, up to four minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I should probably declare that I've had a bus pass since last summer, uh, and I've now saved somewhere in the region of £150 uh, since then. I, I generally prefer to use public transport if it is practical, uh, quite apart from the obvious e environmental benefit. And using the bus or the train lets you do many important things, like reading committee papers for coming here or engaging in profound conversations on Twitter. Again, I find myself very much in agreement with the thrust of the motion. We all want affordable fares, a strong network of routes, reliable services. However, it has to be said that if we are going to go beyond that to get cheaper fares, more routes and more reliable services, there will certainly be an additional cost involved. And frankly, while I'm open to either franchising or public ownership, neither comes without its problems and its costs. Uh, if it's very quick, yes. John Finney. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. Politics is about priorities, and if your priority is to spend six billion in two roads, you're not going to have money for public transport. John Mason. I, I do accept its priorities, but I think my point is if we put more into buses and public transport, there will be less money somewhere else. Now, frankly, while I'm open to either franchising or public ownership, neither comes without its problems and costs. Our train system is franchised and costs a lot of money. As I understand it, London buses are also franchised, and last time I looked, cost something like £700 million per year, which is £100 per person of the population. We used to have public ownership of buses in Glasgow, and there were still complaints. I grew up in Rutherglen, and folk there used to complain that the outlying schemes like Castle Milk got a much better bus service, because that was where the Labour councillors got most of their votes, and they fixed the buses to serve these areas. So whoever owns and operates our bus services, someone still has to decide which services are viable and which need to be reduced. I do think there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation here. Is it fewer people using the buses that leads to reduced routes? Or is it reduced routes leading to fewer passengers? In my constituency, I do think the improvement of the rail service on the Whiflet line has encouraged some people to switch from bus to train. Personally, I do prefer if I can use the train or the bus rather than my car. However, one of my neighbours was saying to me, why on earth do you leave your car at home and use the train or the bus? To him, I think it was partly a status thing and a sign of being in control, that he would use his car virtually all the time. Many people do still want their own cars. No waiting around at bus stops or train platforms gets them door to door, drop off the kids at school and carry on to work. And again, there can be a certain amount of stigma in some circles, as I think both uh, John Finney and Colin Smith uh, have referred to, around bus travel. And the bus is not the, the transport method of choice for some people. I remember seeing an exchange in a film, I think it was called The Crash, if you've seen it, which was set in Los Angeles. One of the characters says, you have no idea why they put these great big windows and sides of buses, do you? Why, says his mate. One reason only to humiliate the people of colour who are reduced to riding on them. Okay, we've got a slightly different situation, but I think the point is made. So while I do have a lot of sympathy for the motion of the Greens, I really do wonder if we can set statutory targets for bus usage, which sounds like trying to force people to use buses. We will also have to do something on changing the education and the culture to get people enthusiastic. And there can be tensions as well eh, between two different good things. Low emission zones can push up the costs of the bus industry, maybe pushing up fares. In Glasgow, we have pedestrian zones, which are good, but the buses have to do circuitous routes around them, and that can uh, damage journey time and emissions. So in, in summary, I do support very much what the Greens are saying, but I do have some reservations. Thank you. Peter Chapman, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding officer. And I need to declare an interest as well, as I too have a bus pass. But uh, I haven't actually used it yet, so there you go. Quite right. I welcome John Finney's motion as amended by my colleague Jamie Green. Increasing bus usage and making services available to as many people as possible is something I'm sure everyone in this chamber can support. Not only does this have socio-economic benefits, but environmental benefits too, as an increasing number of public transport using and decreasing personal vehicle usage would greatly reduce our carbon emissions. It is hard to see why in a large city like Edinburgh people would not want to take the bus. 
It is relatively cost effective. Bus lanes provide journeys free from congestion. And with eight bus companies providing services, they can take you pretty much anywhere. However, when you look to the Northeast region, which I represent, it's a different story. One in five bus routes in Scotland have been axed since, axed since 2010, many of which were rural services. And as numbers of people using rural services decreased, the routes offered have also decreased in a never downward spiral. And the last remaining people using these routes are relying on their councils subsidising services. However, it is well known that Aberdeenshire Council has been underfunded for years, and with constantly squeezed budget, they have to focus on their statutory duties. Nevertheless, Aberdeenshire Council does subsidise 64 out of 123 routes in the area, spending some £3.7 million a year and serving over 900,000 passengers. Last month, however, they unfortunately had to announce proposals to remove eight routes and to reduce two of, of the routes it subsidised. And with their budget in, for 2018-19 decreased by 4.3% in real terms, they have had no other option. Decisions on local bus service provision must be taken as close as possible to those who would benefit from it. And in practice, improving local authority ability to increase services and passenger numbers is hard, but decreasing their budget certainly will not help. Now, transport accounts for just under a quarter of Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions, and road transport makes up 73% of these emissions. Figures show that the average occupancy of a car is one and a half persons. So in theory, if there are 50 people traveling to work each day in, a ca in cars, and these 50 people switch to a single bus, not only would that decrease our greenhouse gas emissions enormously, but also congestion on our roads. And in that scenario, one bus takes over 30 cars off the road. However, driving has begun to be seen as the easy option. Public transport fares are increasing, routes are reducing, and figures from Citizens Advice Scotland show that nearly two thirds of people are dissatisfied with the bus. We need to reverse this by providing frequent and reliable service at a reasonable cost. We need to encourage people out of their cars and onto the bus. The problem is how to do it. And unfortunately, I haven't time today to explore that further. So, presiding officer, in closing, today's debate is all about vision, a vision to improve the standard of our bus service, to increase public usage of bus services, and a vision of improving our environment. I hope this government will adopt some of the visionary ideas they have heard today across the chamber and do something to reverse the fall in bus usage which has plummeted 17% in the past 10 years. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr Chapman. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Graeme D. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to speak in this debate and thank the Greens and John Finney for focusing on the issue of buses. I want to highlight the issue of integrated public transport uh, by focusing on uh, an example from my own region in South Scotland and on the need for re-regulation more broadly and the issue of um, uh, bus emissions. In relation to integrated transport, I, will, I want to describe briefly what you would have to do if you lived in Lanark uh, to travel to Edinburgh on public transport. Uh, you can't get a train to Edinburgh. You travel to the nearest train station, 15 minute bus journey away in Carstairs. Not too bad, you may think. However, it's not that simple. In the morning commute, you then have to wait for up to 40 minutes for a train after getting off the bus, and at the end of the day, you could find your yourself uh, at, at 5.40 um, from Edinburgh to Carstairs, and I will add that's a very useful time for me, as I often, often take this, but I, I have a car, and for those that don't, they then have to wait to get back to Lanark um, for another 55 minutes. So integrated transport, where is it? This is simply... Uh, perhaps I'm oversimplifying it, but in my view, a lot of it is because private bus companies operate the route and don't have to provide a connecting service to the train station. This is really unacceptable as a situation because it means that living in Lanark and commuting to Edinburgh without a car is near impossible and certainly not practical. While we as a country are asking people to leave their car at home, we are not providing a real alternative. Buses and trains should be our number one short and long distance public transport alternative to cars, not just when people can't drive. 
but for people instead of driving. And of course, as my uh, colleague John Finney has said, a third of people are not even car owners. So integrated public transport is really essential. And I feel I've been talking about this for many years. And has it really happened? The answer is no. In order to achieve this, also, uh, for, for generally for the population, buses must be affordable. And they must go, indeed, where people need to go, more generally, in urban and rural areas, as well as at times they need to go, go there. And the present arrangements for bus contracts, in my view, drive forward an unacceptable state of affairs in both urban and rural Scotland. Profit-driven private companies with little accountability are not going to change the way they operate simply because we ask them to. Bus passenger numbers are falling, as we've heard from many members, and will continue to fall until this government takes some action. I agree with John Finney that a national performance framework indicator should be considered. Scottish Labour has worked in many ways with the Scottish Cooperative Party, Unite the Union and the Socialist Environment Resources Association to take forward bus re-regulation. And we will re-regulate our buses when we come into government, but let's hope that through the Transport Bill that might happen before that. Uh, so, um, Ian Gray had a bill to do this in the last Parliament, which ran out of time, and the time is really now that we need to do this. People can't wait any longer, and the planet can't wait any longer either. Re-regulation will also create the opportunity to set clear expectations for low emissions at a national level. Lothian buses should be re recognised for their lead on this. This will help address air pollution and protect people's health, and uh, uh, my colleague Mark Ruskell has already highlighted the importance of the loan that um, the Scottish Government has for, for the changes in buses, and I hope the Minister will comment on that in his closing remarks. So it's about low emission zones and people's health. It's also about uh, the, the um, greenhouse gas emissions, which uh, are so important and which are part of my brief to, to tackle, along with many others in this chamber. I do look forward to the Transport Bill, and I look forward to the Scottish Government having robust arrangements for uh, the future of our buses, for a whole range of issues that have been highlighted this afternoon, and indeed for the opportunities for um, four minutes, both SNP and um, backbenchers and other members from other parties to bring forward amendments as necessary. Thank you. Thank you. I call Graham Day. Officer, um, I think we would all agree that the current approach to bus provision is not delivering what, what we, and more importantly, the public want. We might disagree with which fault lines are most significant or on the solutions, but I suspect, as MSPs dealing with constituency issues, there is that general point of consensus. I was recently involved in dialogue with a provider over their decision to remove a local service, causing considerable difficulty for a relatively small but not insignificant number of my constituents. And I was struck by the justification offered by the operator for scrapping a service attracting 900 passengers a week on average. They were quite blunt. They weren't making money on the route, so it was being pulled. They also referenced a lack of subsidy. And yet there remains in Scotland very considerable subsidy provided buses, particularly in rural, rural or semi-rural settings. If I recall correctly, just a few years ago, the Bus Service Operators Grant, which is still worth more than £50 million a year, was refocused to link subsidy with kilometres travelled, thereby better supporting uh, distance routes like those in Angus South. The concessionary travel scheme is another form of subsidy insofar as it encourages use of bus services. I think around £200 million has been directed to support that in 2018-19, with 1.3 million people expected to make around 145 million journeys. And beyond that, the government provides bus companies with access to funding streams, recently enhanced streams, to replace old polluting buses, something the main operator in my constituency has made good use of. So the idea that there's not enough support provided for bus travel in Scotland is frankly absurd. And the major problem from my point of view is that, is that we're in a situation where bus companies are only interested in profitable routes. That's the issue we need to crack. Uh, I welcome the fact that the forthcoming transport bill will be used to give local authorities powers to step in and run local bus services. Anything which offers the opportunity of securing a changed approach is worthy of pursuing. But I just caution against that being seen as a silver bullet, especially in areas such as the one I represent. For this to work, it will require local authorities to view this as an opportunity to be grasped. I'm not sure that can be taken as a given. We have a council in Angus which has at times shown too little regard 
for its rural parts. Insisting on no rural focus when putting £2 million in the pot to enhance broadband provision across the county. Scrapping road and pavement winter weather clearing across a range of villages. Withdrawing food waste collections from areas just outside settlements. Introducing changes to recycling provision, which are seen fly tipping incidents across rural areas increasing. And that's not a political point, by the way, as these examples cover periods of different hues of control of the authority, including by the SNP. Can we say with any confidence that when a mindset that these actions betray exists, we can assume councils would instinctively seek to deliver bus services based upon social responsibility and equity of access rather than the bottom line? So whilst I'm supportive of exploring options, let's do so mindful that it won't necessarily bring about improvement unless we crack collaboration and don't have a one-size-fits-all approach. Presiding officer, let me welcome the Greens having dedicated some of their uh, debating time to this issue. It's a debate we absolutely should be having. But in having it, let's recognise the complex nature of the issue and the need for goodwill and cooperation to resolve it in a way that meets the aspirations of the public. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr Day. We move now to closing speeches. I call Ian Gray to be followed by Edward Mountain. Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, I want to add my thanks to the Greens for bringing this uh, topic to the Chamber today because I think uh, one thing there has certainly been a great deal of consensus about throughout the debate has been the importance of buses uh, and the need to act. The Minister himself in opening pointed out that 80% of all uh, public transport journeys in Scotland are taken by bus. Uh, and that's correct, uh, some 393 million journeys uh, a year compared to, for example, uh, 94 million uh, rail journeys. Uh, but as Colin Smith uh, told us, uh, those numbers are changing. The usage on buses has dropped by 17%, uh, while rail passenger numbers have, uh, have been increasing. Uh, and that, I think, is because, as a number of uh, members have referred to, we have let bus passengers down. Uh, over recent years. The, the Minister made the point that, uh, well, he called it a quarter of a billion pounds, 250 million pounds of subsidy is provided to bus services in Scotland each year. But of course, as John Finney made clear, that is significantly less than we spend on roads, uh, and it is also less than the subsidy uh, which is provided to rail. And Colin Smith pointed out that the core subsidy, the bus service operators grant, has in fact fallen by 25% uh, in recent years. It's also the case uh, a number of members have talked about the concessionary travel scheme uh, and the reimbursement of that has also been squeezed in recent years so that the bus operators don't get the benefit that they once did when the scheme uh, was introduced. However, we have also uh, heard a couple of passing uh, references to a, a, a good example of how things can be better and John Finney started this when he talked about buses in my own constituency uh, of East Lothian, and he's absolutely right. Uh, until relatively recently, we were, I think, uh, one of the worst examples of how bus services uh, in this 21st century Scotland can fail uh, communities. Services were provided largely by first bus. It was a poor service. It was unreliable, provided by very old buses, which were uncomfortable. Uh, indeed, it wasn't unusual for them to catch fire uh, en route. Uh, and as a result, uh, with every week that passed, fewer passengers would use those buses. And, and this is the answer to Mr. Mason's, is it a chicken or an egg question? It is a spiral downwards. Poor buses, fewer passengers, less investment by the company. They then began to uh, close down routes, which weren't making them any money and cherry-picked the routes where they thought they could still make money uh, and eventually gave up altogether and walked away. Those services were replaced by Lothian Buses, a municipally owned company who treated East Lothian not as routes but as a network and reinvested their profits in uh, new buses and new routes. So that I now live in a village with about 100 people and have a bus every half hour from my door uh, and even night buses, were I young enough or exciting enough to find myself uh, in the city uh, in the middle of the night. So the question is, if we know it can be done, how do we encourage it to happen elsewhere? Well, Labour has an answer. In the last two parliaments, we've presented bills primarily focused on re-regulation through local franchising. Uh, and we believe that that is the key 
uh, to improve in our bus services. As for the government, that was something they supported in opposition, but I've opposed it in government. Indeed, uh, in the last par parliament, denounced our proposals in the most strident form. So, when the transport minister says he's excited about local franchising and he wants to hear our views, he can't really have been listening for the last nine years because we want to see local franchising come forward. But, presiding officer, as the previous first minister, you used to like to say there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repented. <laughs> we are delighted. We are delighted the government has come round to this Four idea. They could, we could have had it by now if they'd supported our bills. We need to hear less talk of the transport bill. We need to see it come forward and let's get this done. And, sorry, and I call on Edward Mountain to wind up on behalf of the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's debate on bus travel has proved to be a much-needed sharing of ambitions that I hope will help the Scottish Government in their forthcoming transport bill. Everyone is really rightly concerned about their bus services as they see them. For too long, timetabling issues and gaps in services mean passengers are heavily inconvenienced and wonder actually if they should be using buses at all. Examples of one-minute connection times, for example, are just not acceptable. Many in rural areas that have to cope with older buses that often have no heaters and high admissions, as highlighted by Mark Ruskell and Peter Chapman, find that bus travel is not something that they look forward to. But it doesn't actually just end there. Constituencies have found in the Highlands that buses have been removed from routes due to breakdowns and retasking. The result is that appointments are missed and a level of distrust of bus companies has resulted in lower use. Now, I will briefly... Uh, John Finney. Thank you, Mr. Officer. I'm grateful for the member taking the intervention. Would the member agree with me if there was some coordination around perhaps school contracts, it would make some services more uh, viable? Edward Mountain. I absolutely believe coordination, proper management between all levels would make a much better bus service, which is, must be what we're aiming for. Now, we must, uh, I believe, also understand that the scrapping of bus services will have long-term consequences in rural areas. We know only too well that once a bus service is removed, communities feel isolated and opportunities are closed off to them, and they seldom see that bus service coming back. Now, we agree as a party with John Finney that we need to halt the decline in bus use, um, and this is despite the financial contribution the government makes. But this is not an argument, as he has made, between buses and trains. It's many rural areas don't have the access to, to trains, and therefore we, we must, as he says, support both. It's making buses and trains attractive to use. We also agree with the Minister that we need to do something urgently to prevent the decline in bus use. And we also agree that taking central control will not help. Now, as Jeremy Green actually pointed out, uh, we can't dilute the message that John Finney has put. And we want to promote the use of buses. And we also believe that, as Jamie Green made clear, that cherry-picking profitable routes serve Scotland and the bus users badly. We also agree with Colin Smith that our bus services are lifelines for students and for non-car users and for rural users. I'm really short of time. If it's brief, I, I, I will, Mr Gray. Ian Gray. It, 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 south of the border, the Conservative government have come to the view that the way of achieving these things, Mr Mountain, is to allow particularly in cities local franchising. Will they agree with that? Edward Mountain. <laughs> I think that what I'm doing is looking at what's going on in Scotland, and I don't want to take the arguments out of the border. There's plenty of people down there who will take the argument up. We have sympathy with uh, Mike Rumble's uh, point that targets and setting targets without pe penalties won't actually achieve very much. We also believe that many in the Highlands would love to use their trains and their buses, but have to use their cars because they don't have the ability to use either of those and we need to give them more choice. We don't necessarily support just the message that Claudia Beamish gave that calls for re-regulation of services, but we do support, I think like all parties in this chamber, the concessionary travel. Now, presiding officer, we welcome this debate and would like to see a complete review of bus provision. It must ensure it delivers for those that it serves and not just to meet targets that are set arbitrarily. 
We would also welcome the increased use of buses, which will be achieved, we believe, by well-managed companies that deliver services across all routes and not just the profit profitable ones. This will need continued government support, which must be targeted to ensure the high quality services we all re require. Now, we remain convinced that the government's amendment dilute, dilutes the emotion that has been proposed by John Finney, so we will not be supporting it. And we would suggest tactfully to the Liberal Democrats that they think very carefully about supporting it and therefore diluting the message that John Finney has rightly brought to the chamber today. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And I call the Minister, Hamza Youssef. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Obviously, I think it's been a, a very good debate indeed, uh, and I thank uh, John Finney and the Greens uh, for bringing it to his Parliament. It doesn't get enough uh, airtime, I don't think. And again, when I compare it to other transport modes, although, of course, they should also be uh, given airtime in this Parliament, the fact that 80% of passenger public transport journeys are done uh, by bus uh, simply isn't quite reflected uh, in the amount of conversation that takes place in this chamber, so I welcome it very much. Um, it is worth saying that, on the whole, although, uh, of course, uh, there are issues around bus services uh, in Scotland being withdrawn, and some members have mentioned the impact that's had in their constituencies. The actual experience of travelling on the bus is one that is popular amongst those that do it. And, and, and the most recent transport focus survey on this just um, a couple of weeks ago it highlighted that where nine in ten passengers uh, were satisfied with the journey they just took. So transport focus uh, have a, a large uh, sample of bus passengers that they uh, interview, that they survey, and importantly, they survey them right after they've uh, been on their journey. So it's quite an accurate, I would say, uh, reflection of bus passengers' views. That's not to say uh, there isn't urgent, uh, isn't ur urgent attention uh, needed. Uh, I do uh, think that we're bringing forward uh, the most radical measures, I would say, in the devolution era when it comes to tackling the issue of the decline of bus uh, patronage. I, I do accept uh, uh, somewhat uh, what Ian Gray says around sinners uh, repenting, um, but uh, I, I don't quite accept it fully because I would say, and, and of course you'll wait to see the detail of this in the introduction of the Transport Bill, I would say uh, we improve upon uh, some of his measures uh, that he's brought forward to this chamber in the past. Of course I will. Ian Gray. <coughs> Aaron, this side of the House, keen to see what those proposals are. Can he tell us when he intends to bring them forward? Uh, the intention uh, is to bring them forward, as I've said, uh, in, this, in this half of 2018, so before the summer recess, uh, is still very much the, the intention. Uh, the reason uh, for some of the delay is that he might know the transport bill is more than just the bus element. We we're thinking of focusing on respons responsible parking, roadwork commissioner, uh, and there's one or two other bits related to LEZs that we might want to bring into that. So because of that, but it, it shouldn't be later, uh, absolutely, than, than the summer, and that is uh, certainly the intention. So I would also make the point gently, although uh, I won't labour the point, that um, when Labour were in power here, they didn't bring forward powers for local franchising nor for municipally owned uh, bus company. So I believe the Scottish Government's proposals in the Transport Bill, which they're waiting to see, will be uh, the most radical bus measures in the devolution era. Uh, Presiding Officer, um, turning to a couple of other points that have been made by other uh, members, turning to, to Mike Rumbles, um, I have been praised by Mike Rumbles twice today, I have to say. I fear any more than I'll be excommunicated from uh, the SNP, but I thought his points on, on concessionary travel uh, were ones that he's now put on the record and others have made uh, also around the chamber. Uh, we are still in listening mode. We've done a consultation. It's had almost 3,000 responses um, and no decision has been made uh, yet. And it would be presumptuous for anybody to think any decision uh, on concessionary travel uh, has uh, been made. It hasn't been made uh, yet. Um, when it comes to some of the other issues, uh, Mark Rusko and I think one or two others, uh, Claudia Beamish, asked about clarity on early Zs. I'm pleased to give that clarity in Derek Mackay's budget. Uh, put forward, of course, uh, we have uh, money uh, for the low emission zones, uh, absolutely ring fence. What I would say is we're also working on uh, a loan scheme uh, as well, working with stakeholders and the bus industry to give it the maximum flexibility because we have to be flexible because for some bus fleets, retrofit is absolutely the right way to go, no doubt about it. When you talk to other bus operators, they don't think because of the age of their fleet and Lothian buses would be in this category, that retrofit would be the right thing to do. Uh, instead, perhaps giving them or providing uh, assistance with the cost to Euro 6 buses might be the best thing to do as opposed to retrofit Euro 3 buses, which don't have much life in them uh, at all. And I'm happy to give way to, to Mark, Mark Russell. Russell. 
<coughs> Minister, for giving way. And just perhaps on a technical point here, would you not acknowledge, though, that the money is there potentially for work on exhaust, not necessarily engines, but from retrofitting large number of exhausts in Glasgow to make sure that that Glasgow LEZ can be as ambitious, um, as ambitious as it can be? In one minute, uh, Mister. Like I said, uh, one minute, uh, like I said in my uh, uh, opening remarks. Uh, I think Glasgow are listening, absolutely listening, to what the Greens have got to say, what Friends of the Earth and others have said uh, around uh, their ambition for the Glasgow LEZ. Um, you know, the, the, the money absolutely uh, is there. We have to be careful, though, because the money that we're putting forward for LEZ, although a portion of that, of course, will be for uh, uh, abatement uh, of, of emissions, uh, will also be in around some of the infrastructure for LEZs. Uh, which is important, whether that be number plate recognition, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What we have to do is continue to work with stakeholders to be as flexible as possible. So the final point I really want to make in my closing kind of 20 seconds is um, transport bill, uh, it sounds like everybody is excited to varying degrees uh, about that. Um, that will not be the silver bullet. We also need local action at a local uh, level. That is what the purpose of uh, my uh, amendment uh, uh, is. And I hope members will wholeheartedly support it because I don't think it takes... Uh, things away other than the disagreement we have over a national target. Uh, other than that, uh, I think it supports generally the aims uh, that most people are in this chamber have spoken to, and I'm delighted that we've had this debate, and I look forward to people's uh, views on our forthcoming transport bill. Thank you, and I call on Alison Johnson to conclude the debate. Um, thank you, presiding officer, and I'd like to thank all those who have contributed, and I think it's fair to say that this has been a fairly consensual debate with a great deal of agreement on many of the issues. Um, I agree with the Minister that congestion is the real issue here. Demand reduction is key. Um, and sometimes that's challenged by local authorities who are increasing free car parking opportunities in our cities and you know, directly contradicting the sea change that, that we want to see. Um, Jamie Green spoke about lifeline services. And for many people, buses are just that. And I was pleased to hear him speak out against the practice of cherry picking routes. I welcome Colin Smith's call for fair work principles to be embedded in contracts with companies. And I share Mike Rumble's support for the many benefits of concessionary travel. And Mark Ruskell spoke of the action needed to ensure that companies and councils can be as ambitious as we might want them to be when it comes to air quality. Um, John Mason, I probably have some concerns about his contribution. I hope you will be as concerned and have as many reservations about your own government's commitment to reduce air departure tax um, as you will to invest in our buses. Um, I would say to the minister though, really, who can have traveled on Lothian buses and not be convinced that it is the way to go? Um, obviously, I, I'm... <laughs> I, I, I'm not biased. I'm, I'm an Edinburgh resident, but I'm so grateful for the service that they provide. Um, and, and that Lothian residents enjoy. But I want everyone to have access to equally good bus, bus travel. And I think the forthcoming transport bill gives us an opportunity to ensure that all regions of Scotland establish a service that's every bit as good as Lothian, which just happens to be owned and managed for the benefit of the local community. Now, Lothian buses have been on the go now for over 100 years, nearly 100 years. They employ more than 2,000 people and they operate around the clock, as Ian Gray has said. 365 days a year. They've been shortlisted this year alone for Public Transport Operator of the Year, bus, Best Bus Service, and for Excellence in Travel Information and Marketing at the Scottish Transport Awards. And I'd like to take this opportunity, we frequently do this in this chamber for, for a variety of occupations, but let's thank all those who drive, who maintain, who clean our buses. Um, uh, and also, I, I can't let this... I can't let this debate finish without mentioning Charmaine Laurie's heroic driving, which saved lives in the snow on Edinburgh streets. Um, but as we know, bus travel was deregulated by the Conservative government in 1986. And deregulation has failed entirely to meet its objectives. It has not increased competition in the sector. It has placed vital public services in the hands of a few profit-making companies who at times have demonstrated little obligation to the communities they serve. Now today, the vast majority of buses in Scotland are run by just two companies. And it's fair to say that we're all contacted with concerns regarding the service they offer um, at times. There are issues raised around regularity, reliability, cost, cleanliness, certainly. Mr. Jamie Green. Green. 
I thank the member for taking intervention uh, briefly. Um, is it the case, though, that in many small towns and rural areas, it's not big companies that are operating the service, it's actually small local businesses who are providing a real vital service, and they're not sitting around in wads of profit either. So, but how do we ensure that there's still a model there, that in rural areas in Scotland, that those small businesses can still be supported? Alison Johnson. Yeah, um, well, recently I was contacted by um, people from Pathhead who were very concerned about the loss of the 5152 service um, run by, by Borders buses, which would have prevented them getting to Dalkeith. So we're working in conjunction there with local authorities. And I think it's key that we see this as a public service that local and national government has an involvement with too. And while, you know, profit seeking companies are delivering this service, they have a part to play. They have, they have to have a responsibility for the job they're undertaking. Um, you know, efficient, low-cost public transport is good for society, it's good for us all. And only recently, the cross-party group on cycling walking became the cross-party group on cycling walking and buses. And we widened our remit because good bus links are so important to our active travel infrastructure I, I, indeed to all of us, buses are the glue in a thriving low carbon transport system and they've got the potential when they're resourced properly to you know, increase individual rail, walking and cycling journeys and I would like to, to say I agree too, Claudia Beamish called for a real alternative um, to the car and in many situations people don't have that, she spoke of journeys that, that you can face trying to access some of our cities from rural parts of Scotland. I mean, buses have relatively low capital costs, they're flexible, and it makes them central to an adaptable transport sector. So we should all be concerned that numbers have fallen. The government's climate change plan has focused on electric cars. Fine, better than diesel and petrol cars, but they don't reduce congestion. You can sit in an electric car traffic jam, your bus can still be waiting for a long time. And when people complain that their bus hasn't arrived on time, it's usually because our congested roads are holding them back. Um, there's a gender issue too here. In gender of stress, thank you, presiding officer. Um, in closing, I would just like to say, I do have the last word in this debate, um, I'd just like to say that a statutory target in the Transport Bill to increase bus patronage would help to focus our efforts. And if we're serious about social justice in Scotland, we have to be serious about buses. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on better buses. We'll just take a few seconds for ministers to change seats.